Hi, I'm Tessa Davis. I'm a paediatric emergency medicine consultant. Today we're going to look at a basic approach to the assessment of finger injuries in children. Before you start talking to or examining the child, it's important to know the anatomy. So the fingers have three bones. You've got the distal, the middle and the proximal phalanx. And there's two joints in there. So the one furthest away from the child is the distal interphalangeal joint and the one closest to the child is the proximal interphalangeal joint. The thumb's got two bones, the distal and proximal phalanx and one interphalangeal joint. And although the hand bones aren't on here, you've got five metacarpals and where they meet the proximal phalanx is the metacarpal phalangeal joint. So knowing the bones is good, but you also need to know how to describe the surface of the injury. So you've got the dorsal surface, the volar surface, you've got the ulnar and radial side of the hands. And it's also important to know the numbering system. So yes, you've got a thumb, index finger and so on, but they're also numbered one to five. So between a combination of all of that, what you should be able to do is to be able to describe carefully and accurately any wounds, swelling, tenderness, injuries that you can see. And this is important for your documentation, but it's also important when you're discussing with a senior colleague or referring to a specialty. So you know that you are accurately describing your findings. Now you know the anatomy, it's important to go on to the next step, which is to take a history from the patient. And for this, we use the hand history model. The H in the hand history model is for how. How did the injury happen? Get some details about the mechanism and the timing. H is also for hobbies. So does the child have any hobbies or skills that are particularly relevant to their hand function? Like, for example, if they were a professional violinist. A is for altered sensation. Here you're thinking about nerve injury. So is there any numbness, tingling or pins and needles? And N is for needles themselves. So is the vaccinations up to date? And does the child need a tetanus? So is it a dirty wound? N is also for non-accidental injury. Is the mechanism in keeping with the injury we're seeing? Is this injury from self-harm? So for example, a teenager punching a wall or getting into a fight in anger. D is really important and it's about dominance. So is the injury in the dominant or non-dominant hand? It's crucial to document this because it has important implications for the functional outcome of the patient. So you've done the hand history and now it's time to start your examination. And the first step of that is simply to look. So you should have a good rapport and without actually touching the child, you can get a lot of information by looking. So look at what they're doing with their hand at rest, how they're using it when, when they're playing. And it's a great time to use a play specialist if you've got one because they'll help get the child moving. What you're doing in the look stage is looking for bruising, swelling, abrasions or open wounds, looking for any nail bed injuries. We also want to check for any clinical deformities and that's going to include a rotational deformity, which you can see here. Because the normal cascade, the fingers point towards the thinner eminence. They shouldn't be overlapping like they are here. You might not be able to see a rotational deformity until the child makes a fist. And these are important because minimally displaced fractures on x-ray might actually be clinically significant if they result in a rotational deformity. So get into a good habit of this being part of your routine assessment, which is to assess and document the presence or absence of a rotational deformity. So you've had a look at the child. The next step is to feel. A good tip here is to examine the unaffected hand first. So this will get the child more comfortable, put them at ease, reduce their stress. When you're examining, make sure you examine the whole hand. What's important here is to develop a systematic approach to the examination of the hand. So even though this is just a finger injury, you should be examining the whole thing. So yes, you're palpating the finger bones and the joints that we discussed. You'll palpate the metacarpals, the metacarpophalangeal joints. You'll also palpate the carpal bones. When you do this, make sure that you also palpate the anatomical snuff box and the scaphoid tubercle. And if you've got a good system for this, you'll know that once you've done your examination, you're going to have picked up any underlying tenderness leading to the identification of fractures. Also in your feel section, make sure that you evaluate the neurovascular status. That means feeling for pulses, feeling for cap refill and temperature, noting pallor, but also testing the sensory function here of the nerves. So know the distribution of the median radio, radial and ulnar nerves. 
After you've done the feel stage, you want to move on to the move stage. What we're doing here is just getting the child to move. You want to see them flexing and extending all these joints in their hand. We'll go into more detail in future videos on how to assess movement when we look at specific types of injuries. But for now, just get them moving and note down what they can and cannot do. As part of this, when you assess the move, what you want to do is assess their nerve function as well. So rock, paper, scissors is good for the median, radial and ulnar nerves and the OK sign is great for the anterior interosseous. So we've gone through an approach to how to know the anatomy and how to assess a child with a finger injury. And that's going to be taking a hand history and looking, feeling and moving. To read more about this, check out Sinead Fox's DFTB post, which I will link to. Thank you.